This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for attending our fifth and final installment of Sit Down with Sabin, uh, which is a weekly conversation in which Sabin Russell engages lab staff about uh, the ups and downs of innovative science. My name is Dan Croats with Berkeley Lab Public Affairs. Uh, you can catch this uh, conversation as well as the past four uh, on our YouTube channel, which is uh, YouTube slash Berkeley Lab. The previous four ones we've run over the summer are already uploaded, and this one should be up there within a couple days afterwards. Uh, during this conversation, we certainly want to hear from you in addition to the conversation that will be taking place on the stage. Uh, so w during the Q&A portion, which takes place the latter 15 minutes or so, uh, please raise your hand, and we'll send a microphone to you. We're videotaping this, so we want to make sure that we catch your question for our viewers to, to hear at a later date. Um, a little bit about our moderator, Sabin, before I uh, hand the mic over to him. He uh, comes to Berkeley Lab, came to Berkeley Lab last year after a long career as a Bay Area health and science reporter. Uh, this included 22 years at the San Francisco Chronicle, freelance work at the uh, New York Times, as well as a fellowship, uh, science, and science journalism fellowship at MIT. Uh, during his career, he's best known for his work covering HIV and AIDS in Africa and the US. He also covered a range of other topics, such as the uh, tsunami in Sri Lanka and the Columbia shallow disaster. So he's, he has a, a wide range of experiences to pull from uh, as he has these conversations on stage this past summer. Right now, he's employed in the Creative Services Office here at Berkeley Lab as a, as a lead uh, science writer in which he, he can work with anybody in the lab staff to develop uh, really cool content for a website or proposals and things like that. So if you have any ideas to, to, uh, for, for Sabin, please grab him after the talk, and I'll now hand the stage over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And uh, th thank all of you for coming here. Um, as Dan said, this is, is the last of this particular uh, series, this experiment we have as a conversational style presentation of, of what's new and interesting and important in the lab. And uh, part, of the, part of the structure of this is that, that in this conversational format, we don't allow PowerPoints, the usual crutch of, of, uh, of researchers who are presenting on stage. And uh, we think that it helps to, uh, you know, sort of like, um, an impending execution help concentrate the mind. And um, in a way, it, it's a kind of discipline to, to use, our, use our own words to describe uh, sometimes very complex things to a general audience um, is, a, is, a, is a useful way of um, clarifying our own thoughts at, at times. And the, uh, another purpose of this is, is simply to celebrate the diverse science of this place. Um, uh, I, I sometimes think of, of Berkeley Lab as almost like a science magazine. You, you uh, can flip through uh, the pages and find all kinds of an extremely interesting work going on in this place at the various buildings, whether it's uh, uh, cosmology in this building or, or nanotechnology up at the molecular foundry. And I think if you just look at the, the five programs that we've had so far, it, it, it reflects the, the extreme diversity of, 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 of topics. Uh, we study here. Uh, we started out with uh, David Schlegel talking about the hunt for dark energy. And then we had Venkat uh, Srinivasan tell us about the future of batteries. Uh, Margaret Torn then came on and talked to us about um, the carbon cycle and, and the microbial communities in soil and the role they play in the carbon cycle. Um, just last week, we had a very interesting presentation that was a little different in, in that it was not a, a bench scientist, but um, a, 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 a business school graduate and a, a person who, uh, who is um, an expert in, in uh, studying human behavior, um, Mar Marion Fuller, talking about how do we persuade people to buy into the energy-saving technologies that we're developing here. And today we're going to be talking about biofuels. 
And um, we're extremely lucky to have here today Henrik Scheller. Uh, Dr. Scheller uh, comes to us from Denmark. Uh, he got his PhD from the Royal Agriculture University in Denmark and then um, had a career as a professor at the University of Copenhagen or Copenhagen and then um, came to Cal for a career as a professor of plant uh, biochemistry at Cal. In 2008, he joined the lab at J-Bay, where he is now vice president for feedstocks at the Joint Bioenergy Institute. And um, he is also uh, director of, um, of uh, cell wall biosynthesis and he's a senior scientist at Berkeley Lab. Um, I'm extremely pleased to present to you Dr. Scheller. Thank you. So, uh, Henrik, we, we're, we're going to be talking a lot about um, modifying plants to make them into better biofuels. Uh, the term biomass is, is central to any discussion about biofuels. I, I thought it was interesting that um, you know some of us who do research here get involved in very, very narrow disciplines studying something extremely esoteric. But your chosen field is, if I'm not mistaken, the, the most abundant biomaterial on, on the planet. Um, tell us about it. Yeah. <clears throat> we Biomass is the most abundant uh, living material on the planet. It's uh, what makes up most of the uh, trees and, uh, and the plants that we have around us, so especially in the forests around the world. Uh, even though they're being cut down all the time, there is a lot of biomass accumulated in all those uh, plants. And that biomass is composed of Many different components, but uh, mainly three components. It's cellulose, it's uh, another type of uh, polysaccharides that we call hemicellulose, and then a, um, a type of polymer that is called lignin. And, and uh, this is essentially material from the cell wall of any, any plant cell, whether it's uh, presumably uh, microscopic or a, a, a sequoia tree? Yeah, all, all plants' uh, cells are surrounded by a cell wall, um, especially the part that makes up the biomass, uh, that is the stems of the, of, the, of the plants, and they have very thick cell walls. And, and we're, we're essentially talking about a, a natural solar energy storage system here, right? that the, it's solar energy that, that is um, through the process of photosynthesis um, makes this material. Um, and in an effort to uh, create biofuels out of this biomass, um, I understand we have a pretty high bar to clear. Um, because why? <laughs> well, <clears throat> plants didn't evolve to uh, be easy to convert into biofuels. Uh, the cell walls that we're talking about here, they are very complicated structures with many different types of polysaccharides that are interacting with each other in complicated ways. And it's really, the plants make them so that they're difficult to take apart so they can last in trees. The sequoia tree you mentioned, other trees that can stand there for thousands of years without being degraded. That's their purpose in nature. We want to degrade these cell walls into sugars that can be converted into fuels by, by fermentation. And um, degrading those cell walls into sugars in an economically reasonable way is, is, is a big challenge. So, so that the focus of your research then is, is to, I guess, uh, use uh, genetics to to develop uh, biomass that is more amenable to uh, this process of, of conversion in, into uh, into biofuels. So, is is there um, is there in a sense an ideal uh, type of, of of what are the ideal traits that you want to have in, in a in a potential uh, feedstock? Yeah. So for um, for um good industrial process of making biofuels, we really want plants that are high yielding and are 
um, resistant towards stress in the nature, cold or salt or drought or from pathogens. Uh, so these are very important traits uh, that you want in a biofuel crop. But in, in JBA, the Joint Bioenergy Institute, we are focusing on the downstream traits. So the traits that make it easier to to deconstruct the biomass into sugars and ferment them into fuels. That's that's the focus that, that we have in JBay, uh, because that allows the feedstocks group that I represent to interact with the other groups in JBay, which make the deconstruction and the fermentation. Uh, so just to point out that, that there are some very important traits uh, of yield economic properties that we are not studying. But we are studying if we can develop plants or how we can develop plants that would be more easy to degrade. So they would require less chemical treatment um, to allow enzymes to, to um, depolymerize the polysaccharides into sugars. Mm -hmm. Or we could use less enzymes. Mm -hmm. So different ways that we can change the biomass so that it could be easier to degrade. But also different ways that we can change the biomass so we get rid of compounds that are inhibitory to fermentation. That's a big problem that biomass contains chemical components which are, are toxic to for yeast, for example, when mm -hmm. you want to ferment sugar into ethanol. So, so without um, getting at all involved in, into any sort of genetic manipulation of plants, we, we already have a kind of a roster of, of biofuels out there today. We can think of corn, for instance, as is made into uh, ethanol. Um, I, I hear that uh, uh, sugar cane is maybe the best um, uh, natural source of bio, uh, biofuel right now. Um, we talk about switchgrass. Um, before we start talking about modifying um, the, the, those particular um, plants, uh, what is it about, um, about some of these existing plants that makes them uh, biofuels today. Why, why corn? Well, so there's a big uh, industry based on making corn-based uh, ethanol, but in that case, uh, it's only the starch in the grain that is being converted into ethanol. That process of converting starch into sugar and fermenting it into ethanol is quite well developed. It has been actually for thousands of years, uh, but the yield in terms of you know gallons per hectare or something um, is, is really not that good, and it also takes input of energy to farm the corn, and you almost, well, it's debated whether you really get more fuel out of it than you put into it in the first place, so so it's not uh, so good. We really need to use more of the plant than just the, the grain starch. Uh -huh. And uh, I think another another fuel we often hear about is switchgrass. Why switchgrass? What what is it about that particular plant? Well, switch does a significant interest in switchgrass, especially here in the western part of the U.S. It's a native species. It grows um, very well. It doesn't require much input. You can grow it with uh, not very much water, or very little fertilizer. Uh, which is also different from corn, where you need quite a lot of water and fertilizer to get a good yield. So switchgrass seemed to be a plant that we would be able to get good yields with much lower input. And is it, I presume that switchgrass, you're, you're not necessarily competing with food uses of, of, uh, of the land it that is, would be used to grow the, corn? The, the hope and the, the stated goal of, of Department of Energy to develop bioenergy crops that can grow on what we call marginal land, so land where we would not uh, now grow food crops. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that way it would be possible to expand the agricultural area to grow crops for biofuels without impacting food production. And then, and then we have sugarcane, for instance. Uh, that that just sounds right away like it might be a great biofuel because it's got the word sugar right in the name. It is great. Sugarcane works really well. Brazil has a very well-developed industry making uh, fuel out of sugarcane. Um, there's a lot of sugar that can be fermented very easily to, to fuel. But the uh, problem with this, we cannot grow sugarcane uh, everywhere. It, it, again, it requires uh, significant input, but it also takes a climate that we don't have in most of the U.S. So we, we need to look at other crops for, for the U.S. So, so that's, that's basically a, a little bit of a review of what, what we're dealing with. But of course, you come in and, and 
and you like to deal with mutants, um, you're, you're trying to find, uh, to, to impart traits into these uh, potential biofuels or other, others that would make them more amenable to this, this degradation process. Um, uh, we, we don't allow PowerPoints here, but, but we do allow props. And what have you brought to the audience today? Well, I brought some of the plants that we work with. So this is our main uh, biofuel crop that we work with in the lab. Uh, this is an Arpidopsis plant, Arpidopsis italiana, and it's, um, it's the most used plant species by plant biologists around the world. So this is our model species. It, it, it's also called, uh, I believe, thale cress, right? Yeah, that's uh, the English name. So you use the term model species, and I think of a model species, I think of um, like, like fruit fly or um, C. elegans, the nematode worm, um, the zebrafish. Um, what, is, what makes this a model species? Well, it has been uh, chosen by a group of plant scientists that have uh, agreed that as many people as possible should work with this plant, and it makes a big advantage when many researchers are working with the same species because then you can really uh, exchange material and you can you can get a much deeper understanding that everybody is working on something different. Now the reason that this particular species was chosen was that it's, as you can see, it's not a very big plant. It, can, it looks like a weed. It is a weed. It's a <laughs> common weed that grows uh, over most of the world. It grows wild in the U.S. Uh -huh. and many other places. Um, and, and it doesn't have any, any commercial use other than as a model plant for plant sciences. But it, it's small, so it doesn't take much space in, in the growth chambers or greenhouses uh, where we would grow them. It's, it um, grows from seed until seed set uh, very quickly. In maybe six weeks, we can have a new generation, which is also very important. Uh, you can do your experiments much faster than if you're working with fir trees or something. Uh, it's very easy to transform. It's the most easy plant that you can genetically transform. So, so um, are, are its genetics um, simpler than other other species, perhaps? Or simpler like, than, a, like a fruit fly? Yeah, so that was also one of the reasons it was chosen that the genome is uh, very small. Uh -huh. um, uh, yeah, 125 uh, million base pair, which is uh, much less than many other plants. Have, have they sequenced and, the and gene yet? And the, the, all the, ge the genome was sequenced, uh, I think it's now 11 years ago or something. That was the first plant genome that was uh, fully sequenced. The first, the first one? The first one. Okay, so, so this plant has been um, a tool in the, the plant biologist's um, laboratory for a long time now. Yeah, yeah, especially the last uh, 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. and, and so, is this plant um, something that you could grow like crazy and and uh, and, and toss into the fermenter at uh, at at, uh, at Bay and make make some biofuel? Well, we do that at Bay. <laughs> uh, we do grow them. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> and we harvest the plant material and we make biofuel out of it uh, because this is our model plant. But you wouldn't get very many uh, gallons per hectare if you would grow these on a commercial scale. So it is only for us a model species. We want to find out ways to modify plants. We are confident that Arpidopsis is not different from the real crops that we would want to use. And if we can demonstrate a way to make Arpidopsis a better biofuel crop, then that would also work in, in the real crops. So uh, essentially, you're using this model species to learn about the, the, the gene functions of plants, because we don't we don't, we don't have that down yet, I, get, I gather. No. Yeah. It's, it's quite a, for me, it's, it's a really amazing, and that's one of the reasons I got into studying plant cell walls in the first place. And this is the major material in the living world, the cell walls. They make up, as we just talked about, the, the lar largest part of, of, uh, of nature, living things in nature. And we don't know how they're made. When I started, got into the field, we really didn't know any of the genes that make any of the polysaccharides uh, in the cell wall. Now we know some more, but there's still a lot of things we don't know. And most of it we don't know. So this, I think, is a very interesting challenge in itself. Are, are, is there enough homogeneity among plants in the, in the plant world that, 
a gene that you find a function for in in this um, Thalecrest. I'm not going to I'm not going to try a, a Arabidopsis. Um, is is a gene function that you find in this plant transferable to um, say sugarcane or um, sawgrass or, or some other potential biofuel? Yeah, it, it is. And we can see that now where uh, several other plant genomes have been sequenced. As you can take a gene from, from rice and put it in Arpidopsis and it will work in the other way around, or from a poplar tree and it will work in Arpidopsis. So, so these things are very well conserved. Um, when we just look at the individual genes, we know that and that, that they function. We are not looking necessarily only at single gene traits, but also making more sophisticated engineering uh, that we can talk about. And we still have to prove that they will work in, in, in other plants, but there seems to be so much conservation in the way plants function. So even though it doesn't look like a tree, it's not that different, really. Well, the, the, the science of genetics pretty much started with plants, um, um, and, and grafting as a very common practice in agriculture. Are plants any easier to genetically modify than, than, um, than uh, animals or bacteria? Well, bacteria the, are easier to modify. Uh, they're, they're easy to transform because they grow so fast you can do it quickly. Ah. Um, plants are, it depends on the plant. Arpidopsis is pretty easy to, to transform. We just uh, take plants a little bit younger like this and dip it into a solution with, uh, with genetically modified bacteria and then the plant becomes genetically modified too. So it, it's, it's very easy with Arpidopsis. Do you, do you work with the seeds or with the plant tissue? Well, you take the flowers. So then the seeds that will develop from those flowers will mm -hmm. be genetically modified. Uh -huh. that's, that's how we do it. And it's, it, it works very well with Arpidopsis. But it's not always that easy. The switch grass that we talked about it's a lot more complicated to genetically engineer. So, so the term traits is often used when you talk about genes. If, if, you, if you could um, modify a plant to make it um, more amenable as, uh, as a biomass, biofuel, um, what are some of the traits? I think you mentioned density. Um, wh wh why is density important? Well, if you look, if you Look at that does a, not look very dense. No, well, it is. If you look at a stem of a grass, you know it has a big hollow in the middle, and uh, also if you look at the individual cells, well, they have thick cell walls, but there's a big space uh, which is filled with water or with air. So actually, here, here you, you, you don't have to hold it the whole time. Okay, <laughs> and wave it around. So s straw is not that heavy, and uh, we think that uh, if we can engineer the plants to be more dense, it would be major savings in transportation. And we would also hope that we could actually get a higher yield per hectare uh, by making the plants more dense. So it's just almost pure economics and, yeah. and, 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 and very practical things. That yeah. And pack, and pack more biomass into a, 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 stalk, a stalk of yeah. a plant. And something that shouldn't affect plant growth in any negative way. Now, have you actually, have you, have you, have you tried that? Uh, yeah, so we have uh, developed technology and we have shown it with Arpidopsis, again, that we can, we can uh, express some of the genes that synthesize the cell walls mm -hmm. in specific cell types and, and that way make more dense biomass. What, what, about, what about the, uh, the sugar content, for, for example? Um, is there a way to boost that? I mean, that yeah, uh, that would seem to be the, the thing you really want to do more than almost anything. And that's actually what we're doing, because as I mentioned before, we have cellulose and hemicellulose and lignin in the plants. And the lignin is about 30% of the, of the biomass. And it's, it's something that prevents degradation. And when the biomass is degraded, that lignin cannot really be used very easily for anything. Is, so, is lignin essentially what we think of when we think of wood? Well, it's a component of wood. Uh, it's a, again, about a third of the wood bio, of the wood mass. So, so I t if I took a, away the lignin, uh, if I genetically stripped the lignin from, uh, from a, a tree, what would happen to that yeah, tree? That would be, in theory, a very good uh, feedstock for biofuel production because it would be easy to degrade. 
But the problem is that the plants make lignin for a reason. They need lignin to strengthen the stem and to, to be able to transport water. I brought a mutant also that that is a, that is a mutant that Maybe is, you point uh, that right at the uh, camera there. Sorry. <laughs> um, that, is, that see a, it here. is that a mutant of this? So this is a mutant of Apidopsis, but this is one where the, those uh, um, cell walls have been, have been modified in a way so that uh, they have low lignin and low hemicellulose content. And the plant so you, you actually have done what I, I was almost joking. You actually yeah, have done that. I mean, this is a mutant. I couldn't bring transgenic plants here, but, um, but this has low lignin. And if, I'm sure if we took this plant and try to convert it into biofuel, it, we would see that it would be much more easily converted. But we wouldn't get very much out of it, right? It, it, doesn't, look, it doesn't look very happy. Yeah. <laughs> but we have found a way where we can take plants that have reduced lignin or hemicellulose naturally, like this one, and then we can engineer them so that we put back this lignin or hemicellulose only in specific cell types. Mm -hmm. So instead of putting it back everywhere, then we would just make the wild type again. But we can put it back in specific cell types so that the plant will look like the wild type but still have very low content of lignin and hemicellulose. Uh -huh. And if we, in addition to that, we increase the density, well, then we have already changed the plant in several ways that will all make them much better uh, for biofuel production. Mm -hmm. We've done that with our products. Now, I, I, when I think of JBay, I often think of some of the work they're doing um, with with micro with bacteria to genetically enter the, near them to make it easier for them to eat this stuff um, to break it down. Um, I guess it all in the end has to do with enzymes. Um, are, are you involved in uh, uncovering enzymes that may play a role in, in um, either strengthening or weakening cellulose in these plants? Well, we work closely together with the, with the enzyme group in, in JBay. We are not directly involved in discovery of, of new enzymes, uh, which they generally find from microbes. Mm -hmm. Um, but we use our plant material to to uh, test with their different enzyme mixtures. And uh, you know, I, I'm just kind of thinking here uh, about some genetic engineering things that go on with plants. And I, I think of a product like Roundup, the weed killer. They they sort of genetically engineer uh, a plant to be resistant uh, to, ra to to survive Roundup, and then they can spray the weed killer on, maybe less of it, um, kill all the weeds but not kill the plants. Is there, is there any kind of synergy that you can develop, say, develop a, a plant that, that looks like an ordinary piece of switchgrass but has some sort of genetic flaw in it that uh, makes, it, um, makes it vulnerable to a, 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 a particular uh, enzyme or, or genetically engineered bacteria? Can, they, can there be some synergy in the two genetic engineering arms, one to break the stuff down and the other to produce it um, and make, make them work with each other? Uh, am I making any sense? Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. We, and we think along those lines as well. So we're making modification to the polysaccharide and that those altered cell walls may require a different mixture of enzymes uh, for the optimal degradation. So we work together with the deconstruction people on that. But especially in the, in the area of the lignin, we are, we are engineering plants with not just less lignin, but a different lignin composition. Mm -hmm. and, and then we want to see if we can develop ways to convert that modified lignin into something more valuable than the lignin of very little value that we have now. So anytime people start talking about genetic engineering of plants, um, uh, there, there, there is a whiff of controversy about that, that, that topic. Um, have you ever encountered it in, in your work? Yeah, I, I come from Europe and uh, people there are very, uh, generally very much against genetic engineering. It was one of the reasons I left, but I, <laughs> because I thought, no, thought I wouldn't uh, encounter that so much here. But I see that there is also some skepticism about GM plants in the U.S. Um, we certainly have to be careful not to put anything out in, in nature or in the field that could cause a problem, for example, uh, spread as a, as a pest uh, mm -hmm. that, that in an unintended way. Um, 
And that's, that's why you brought a natural mutant here as opposed to a transgenic uh, yeah, plant. Yeah. yeah. Eventually, of course, the crops will have to go out in the field, and there are procedures that, for regulation that one can be allowed to do that uh -huh. with genetic engineering. But, uh, do, you, do you think there are any, any kind of risks inherent in developing a genetically modified um, uh, plant for, for, fuel, for uh, feedstock? Um, people tend to get more concerned about um, things that they're going to eat as opposed to things they're going to put into a fermenter. But I, I'm just wondering um, if, if there are any things that ought to be avoided. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there are big problems. I don't want to say that we shouldn't worry at all because we should be careful with what we do. But in general, when we modify plants to be more easily degraded, we would not expect them to have any advantage out in the field. On the contrary, we, if anything, we worry that maybe they will not grow so well in the field because they are less resistant to and less robust to less robust. So, so that is, is more our concern. And we'll be very surprised if we would make a plant that will actually grow better in nature than than the unmodified plant. Huh? Uh, we'll need to assess that, but I, I think it's not a big risk. At, at some level, it, it almost seems too easy. You just, you know, find a nice trait to make make a plant make more sugar, or find a nice trait to knock down its um, uh, knock down its lignin level. Um, that seems all within within reach. Maybe it is, but I, I'm just wondering. Uh, you must, as any scientist, spend a lot of time tearing your hair out uh, with with problems. I mean, what, what are some of the Without getting into too deep a science, what's an example of a, of a problem that you encounter in the whole biofuels process that, that people are, are working on? We, we work on several different uh, traits, and, and it, it's always the general problem is that plants evolved to make cell walls that are really good to protect the plants against uh, the environment, against uh, organisms. So whenever we try to perturb that, we run into a risk that the plant will not grow as well. And you can see that here with this one, that it didn't grow very well, right? So we need to, to uh, make sure that, we, that the plants that we modify still grow as well as the unmodified plant, because otherwise we will have a uh, yield decrease. You're, you're taking on several billion years of evolution, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do know that it's possible to breed crops uh, into something that humans want uh, and, and do that very efficiently. So I don't think we should be surprised that we can modify plants in a way that is good for us. Uh, but still, we, we, we have to, to <coughs> always ensure that the plants will, will grow well. But we are working with several different traits. So one is, one is the lignin and the hemicellulose with density. We are also working with inhibitors in biomass. Um, as I mentioned before. Inhi inhibitor, is that the acetic acid thing yeah, you made? So tell the audience about, about that problem. So plants, uh, plant biomass, especially from woody plants, has a lot of uh, acetic acid as part of the polysaccharide. So is, that, is that more or less like vinegar? Yeah, the, the, it's like vinegar. It's mm -hmm. uh, not liquid, it's uh, esterified, so it's bound to the sugars. But uh, it has several effects. One is it makes it more difficult to degrade the biomass because mm -hmm. there's um, uh, Acetic acid side groups, they make the, it diff more difficult for the enzymes to degrade the polysaccharide. So that's one thing. But when it gets degraded, then all this acetic acid is released and it's very toxic to some microorganisms. So if you would use yeast to ferment biomass, degraded biomass into, say, ethanol, then that yeast will be very much inhibited by the acetic acid that's present in the plants. So you know, this is this is a problem, especially so, with wood biomass. So there, I guess there's two ways to deal with that. You can make some yeast that can can handle the acidic acid, or you could engineer a plant so that it has less of it locked up inside it. Yeah, we try to do both at JBay. Uh, I guess you could do a third thing, which would be not to use yeast, but use another organism that is uh, naturally resistant to acetic acid. And we, we actually try to do all those things in JBay, so we, d we don't know which one is the right solution, and we have to try different things and see which one. And maybe none of the methods will go all the way, and we have to combine them to get the, the best. Hey, every, uh, the word JBay is used a lot around here. I, 
a lot of people think J stands for Jay Kiesling, but <laughs> but it it uh, actually stands stands for for joint bio joint bio bioenergy. Institute. What what is what, who's in the joint? Yeah, so Lawrence Berkeley Lab is the host institution, but uh, there are five other institutions involved. So this is uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Sandia National Lab, uh, UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. UC Davies, and the Carnegie Institute uh, in Palo Alto. Do, when you're working down there, I mean, do, do you do these other part? Are these other partners um, a, a constant presence, or does it feel pretty much like it's a, it's just Berkeley Lab there? No, there are people from all these different institutions in the in the building, and this is one of the ideas we had with JBay that everybody should be in the same building, not like a typical consortium between different partners where everybody still work in their home institution, just uh, having a joint project. We wanted to have not just a joint project but a joint space. So almost everybody, uh, with the exception of uh, some people in UC Davis, they they are in the same building in Emeryville meet them every day, work together. I understand that not connected to J-Bay, but in the same building, they're, they're opening up a, a pilot plant to test biofuels. Are you going to be involved in that in, in some way? Well, it is, it is not uh, directly connected to J-Bay, it's, uh, but it's so we are on fourth floor, and it's on third floor. It's, it's funded by Department of Energy, and it's uh, a demonstration unit that uh, other DOE institutions can use to test uh, in, a, in a pilot scale biofuel production. Of course, JPA is one of those uh, um, groups of scientists that's interested in using the, the PDU to test some of our things at the large scale, but it, but P it doesn't P belong PDU to us. Is, is uh, fast biofuels processing demonstration De unit. Process demonstration unit. So it's kind of, kind of like a little bit like a pilot plant yeah, to make. It's, it's like a pilot yeah. plant. So the, there'll be some synergy there too. Um, well, one of the things I like to do in this format, uh, because there are um, even high school students at these presentations, is, is ask you a little bit about how you got into your field. You have a very interesting field, plant, uh, plant biochemistry, um, but um, how, how, did you, uh, how did you get, were you always interested in plants? Uh, how did you get started? Well, actually I was uh, interested in animals and I was educated as a zoologist. Um, and then I had to find a good project to work on as a zoologist. I got interested in how insects interact with plants and tried to see if I could use that in a practical way to study pest uh, resistance and pest control. So that naturally got me into plants. And I found that then it was, uh, I wanted to use some of the more modern methods, modern at that time when I was young. Uh, of molecular biology, and it was very hard to do in this insect plant interaction field. So I skipped the insects and just focused on the plants. Just focused on the plants. It's been really and the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> so. so, is there a um, is, is there a particular goal in your mind that uh, that you would like to achieve? Um, you know, in the near term, in the next five years, it, that you think is reachable? Uh, in, in, is there a, like a certain uh, benchmark um, in, in terms of uh, reduction of, uh, of acidic acid or, or uh, increase in density? Um, is there some, some mark uh, that could um, essentially sh show your progress and make you feel good about your work? <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm sure you feel good about yeah, it. I now, feel but. good about our work, <laughs> and we have made a lot of progress in the in the three four years that JBA has been uh, running now. So we have already made plants with less acetic acid. We've made plants with less lignin with higher density. I would really like to see some of those technologies being successful in in real crops, and uh, I think that would be that would prove that our strategy has been the right one and that it actually can make a difference to the American society and to the world that we're doing. And, and I'd like to see that happen. We're already working together with some companies to try to make that happen. We, we don't think that it is our job in JBA to directly make the crops. We, we want to demonstrate the principles and then either pass them on to, to commercial partners or work together with them. So you're, you're creating the tools? Yeah. And, well, and I'd like to see them work. <laughs> and 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 what what sort of time frame in the in the in the in the dis, in the distant time perhaps um, do you think it'll be before we um, we actually develop some some um, 
powerful biofuel feedstocks um, with this technology that will be generally recognized as uh, doing the job? Well, it takes a long time. I think that uh, with the work we do now and with our partnership with the industry, we can probably demonstrate some of these technologies that they work in crop plants, say, in the next uh, three, four years. Three or four years. But that doesn't mean that we're going to have then those companies, once they have seen that the principle works, they will have to breed these traits into their elite varieties and to make different varieties, to test them in different regions of the country, like plant breeders mm -hmm. do. So there we're talking uh, 15 years, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, uh, every time that we've um, opened this forum up to questions from the audience, we usually get some very good ones. and. Um, if uh, we have uh, microphones available, um, if you just raise your hand, the uh, people with the microphones will, will see you, and, and we'd, we'd love to entertain some questions from the floor. Good afternoon. My question is on the growth of the plant. Does it have to be in the United States? Is there a control question or a transportation question? Because the regions that sugar has traditionally been grown other than South, Southern California, Southern America has been international. I think I didn't get the question whether the plants have to be grown in the United States? In essence, yes, because traditionally sugar's grown in South America, um, and I'm not remembering my history very well right now, but it's traditionally been grown either in the southern part of the U.S. or in other outside of the U.S. So the question is, for these genetically mutated sugars that you all are working with, is it a requirement to grow them in the U.S.? Uh, yes. Uh, it's our mandate from the Department of Energy to work with something that is uh, relevant for production of the biomass in the U.S. So, so this has been the, the strategy and political decision that, that this is about developing an industry in the U.S. Um, we would be happy to export and license our technology also to other countries, um, but as as an add-on. But it but it it has to fulfill the criterion that the plants can be grown in the U.S. That that the technologies are relevant for you. So that's an insightful question because uh, food markets are complex and they're political, and um, we don't grow a lot of sugar cane, for instance, in in the United States. Uh, there, it it could be simply that. Uh, uh, we don't have the climate for it, but but um, for that reason, is is developing a um, uh, some genetic traits for, to to boost sh uh, sugar cane uh, sugar content, perhaps a lower priority than than another crop. That I I believe is true. Uh, it's also again it's not part of the project that we have funded from DOE, but it, it would be considered a bit marginal to, to the idea of making uh, biofuel production in the U.S. Interesting. Have some other questions out there? I think in the center I can see what might be a hand up. It was. Hi, gentlemen. Um, I heard you talk about. Uh, basically the sugars in the plants that you're after. And then I'm, I was pretty interested in the, the lipids that uh, algae's produced. And I didn't hear you even really touch on like the, the bioalgae and that type of fuel uh, that I was, I've been reading on. I didn't know, is that something that is not gonna be a viable product? And that's just kind of a, a spook that is in the media or is that like, or is that a legit option? What do you say? Whether algae will be a, a, is algae in the running for one of the top plants that we could potentially use as a new fuel? Yeah, I'm not an expert on algae. Uh, I know there are a lot of people working on it, and the algae they have a, the advantage that they can very efficiently accumulate uh, lipids, which can be converted to fuels quite easily. Uh, I also know that there are some technical issues with how to actually grow the algae and harvest them. Um, I don't think it's one or the other. I think that uh, the, the whole issue of getting energy and substituting petroleum with other fuel, fuels and other, uh, yeah, other, other fuels and other energy sources uh, requires uh, more than one solution, and probably a combination of algae and biomass and wind power, and you need all of them. I, 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 he raises the point about lipids, which are basically fat-producing fat, fat, uh, fat cells or 
glob glob globules of fat. And you know, to my mind, that sounds like it's more combustible. Um, I think of a eucalyptus tree as a kind of an oily tree. Um, are, there, are there plants that produce lipids that might be genetically modified to produce a lot more lipids, or is, is it basically mostly a sugar game? No, it, it, there are plants that make lipids, and it, it's, it's interesting. It's something that we are thinking about, although our current funding doesn't really allow us to explore that in, in a lot of detail. But, but uh, well, a lot of plants accumulate lipids. They do it in the seeds, and you can make biodiesel out of that. And that oh, canola oil, and I mean, yes. I guess most of, a lot of biodiesel is. Yes, uh, this comes, the comes problem from with it that. is that all the oil crops that we have, they have a quite low yield per hectare. So whether you measure the amount of oil per hectare or the gallons of fuel that you get per hectare, it's not that much. So we don't have the really efficient biodiesel crops. But it, plants obviously have the capability to synthesize lipids. So it might be possible to develop plants that could actually make a lot, lot more lipids. And you could imagine that, that it was not only in the seeds where you normally find lipids. But what if you had a potato that had a lot of lipid instead of all that starch? Potato-powered cars. That might be. It, it could happen. Might be possible. I mean, there are trees that accumulate a lot of uh, lipid-like molecules in the stem. Uh huh. Very interesting. Um, I think there are a couple of hands up in the center. The people with the mics probably have a better sense of where the questions are coming from. My question is a little bit different from the previous two, and I'm sure we'll come back to the science in a moment. But JBay is a very interesting organization, as you described, of five institutions, but the scientists are working together collaboratively um, in the same space. Would you share with us perhaps one or two uh, secrets to the success of these side-by-side -side collaborations? What's made them so successful? Well, um, I have been in a lot of uh, consortia before, uh, especially in Europe where I was before, where we would get grants and there would be people sitting in different countries and we would meet twice a year at a meeting. And it's very much, it's, it's much less efficient to work together in that way. And the flow of information is not that efficient. And also there's a tendency that people, they just go home and do their own thing and, and they don't really feel feel so um, obliged to follow the path that has been laid out. And I don't think I can come up with a specific example, but the fact that we meet each other every day uh, at lunch, in the lab, in the <coughs> office, um, and can, can communicate all the time, it does make a big difference. Again, I don't think I can come up with a specific example, but I can certainly feel it every day. Well, H Henrik, when, for instance, you publish a paper, um, are the, usually there's multiple authors in the paper. Is it a typical JBay paper um, re reflect that sort of uh, multi-institution nature? Um, yeah, I think I looked at it recently and I, I think I couldn't find a single paper from Feedstock that division that didn't include some people from another division. Mm -hmm. So we, we do collaborate a lot uh, within JBay and also with people outside of course. A good question. So I don't know much about the chemistry of burning biofuel, but um, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, how clean it burns and um, what, what are the harmful byproducts that are spewn out when biofuel is burnt for energy and how that would play into the whole global warming issue. For example, if we had biofuel in cars on a mass scale. Um, well, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on combustion of fuels, but I would say that, that we are not in JBay focusing on any particular fuel. We are, uh, have decided not to work on ethanol, which is the typical biofuel that most people work with, but the fuel synthesis group, which is led by Jake Kiesling, they work with developing several different types of fuel um, uh, that, that would, can be used as uh, gasoline or biodiesels or jet fuels. Um, I, they, try to make them so that they are similar to the petroleum-based fuels as possible. Uh, I cannot see that there would be any particular difference in the way they burn compared to, to the natural <laughs> fuels, but uh, again, I'm not an expert on combustion. 
Do, do, do plants impart different impurities into into the into a fuel, or is that by the time you get to a fuel, have you basically chemically removed? Yeah, uh, that's that's the point. I think by the time we we would get to the fuel, we we wouldn't have those impurities uh, with the fuel anymore. Because uh, we need to purify the fuel after the fermentation. Because when I, uh, a biofuel diesel truck drives by, I swear I smell French fries, for instance. And so I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, we come up with your potato car, uh, if it's going to smell like a spud. I can see that with, with biodiesels because there you are, you are using the plant material with and the lipids in the plant material without that much conversion. Uh, whereas the approach we are studying in JPE is to, con to degrade the biomass into sugars and ferment those sugars to something that looks like a fuel or is a fuel. And uh, I don't think it would have much uh, properties that depends on which planet it came from at that point. And of course, the environmental question with, with biofuels is that you are recycling carbon that went into the, uh, that was already in the atmosphere um, to make the plants as opposed to uh, releasing carbon from a fossil fuel yeah. and adding to the overall carbon content, I, I guess. Mean, I mean, I would say that uh, I, I don't think that concern is, is, is the biggest one, but one concern one has to, to be aware of is, is to do a, a more complete uh, analysis of what impact it has on the environment to grow those plants and harvest them and transport it to the, to the planet. What impact would the biofuel plant, not the crop plant, but the factory, what impact will that have on the environment, uh, are there any pollutants that is uh, being released there? What impact would it have on CO2 um, in the atmosphere? I think it's important to assess that. Um, we are not studying that in a lot of detail in JBay, but it is mm -hmm. a very important part of, of the whole biofuel uh, development. Did, did we have a question from this mm -hmm. side? Uh, I was wondering if there were any limits to the efficiency of photosynthesis, both in terms of simply uh, solar energy converted to, to plant material, or in particular, uh, the cellulose or other materials that you would use to produce fuels. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think there are some limits. It seemed to be difficult to make more than a few percent of the of the solar energy to get it converted into uh, biomass, and that's in the very most most efficient plants. Maybe they can do two percent, three percent of the of the solar energy that is converted into biomass. So most plants have much less than that, but that that's probably what you what you can get. And there are some fundamental uh, limits to that that you will probably not be able to pass. I don't know how, how far we can go. It's, a, it's another study of the efficiency of photosynthesis. I think it can be improved um, to some extent, but, but uh, we won't be able to use all the energy. It will always be in the single digit percent that we can capture, I'm sure about that. We probably have time for maybe two more quick questions. Uh, yes. um, when you were talking about releasing the plants into the wild and being careful they didn't become pests, you had said you'd be surprised if they were anywhere near as efficient as sort of the non ones, the non engineered plants, because you're introducing flaws. Can you talk about what sort of would be, uh, in terms of inefficiency and in crop reduction or yield, what would be acceptable and what you're looking at at the moment, if, if you know? Well, we try to. We have made a techno-economical model where we can we can model the uh, economic impact. Which is, at the end of the day, it's uh, you know dollars per gallon that matters. So if we make a plant that is much better degraded, if we use much less enzyme and everything, well, we could probably take a 10% hit on the yield. Uh, if our improvement is uh, not so good, well, we don't want to take to take any hit on the yield. And you can calculate that. I mean, and we have models to do that. So you can't answer it with a single answer. Um, we are basically at the point where we are studying our model Arpidopsis plants here. We are going for traits that don't have any effect on, that we can observe on the yield. But again, at the end of the day, one has to do a real study in the field to see what, what the yield will be. 
This is kind of a follow-up to the previous question. Um, you kind of uh, laid my mind at rest that genetically modified plants would not necessarily be a risk. But what about the enzymes that break down lignin? If they become really efficient, really well engineered, and somehow are leaked out, could they eat through plants at mass, for example? We have a hard time finding a very efficient enzyme. I, I mean, nature has uh, had a big, had a long time to try to develop enzymes that are more efficient in degrading lignin and biomass because uh, organisms that live on plant material they benefit a lot from that. So it, I think it's very hard actually to make enzymes that are a lot better. We can make enzymes that are a little bit better, especially if we try to make enzymes that are better on pre-treated biomass, so if the plant material had already been treated in some chemical way, that the enzymes will then work more efficiently. Uh, they don't work that much better if you just take plant biomass that has not been treated in any way. Um, I, I, no, we would be very happy if we found such an enzyme. <laughs> very happy. That's, a, that's a, a, a good couple of words to, uh, to end not only this uh, this presentation today, but our, our, our five uh, program series. Um, um, I, I want to thank uh, Henrik Schiller for a, a very interesting uh, lunchtime conversation. <laughs> and and I, I also, uh, on a personal note, uh, I know some of you people have been here for four or all five of these presentations. Uh, I very much want to thank the audience uh, for participating in this experiment. And uh, we are very interested in your feedback. Um, we may try it again next year. We may try something similar in the fall. Um, your ideas are most welcome, and your criticisms are as well. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this uh, event.